and we'll move on to the second plenary talk. As we all know, although um, the boundaries of the continents may be extremely uh, rigid, the atmosphere is fluid. So let's move from one part of the world to another and begin to look at things in India where I would like to welcome Dr. Prashant Goswami, who leads the Climate and Environmental Program at CMAX, where he's chief scientist. Uh, he, he specializes in interdisciplinary work, bringing in energy, health, agriculture, et cetera, in the broad framework of sustainability in a changing climate. He is recipient of the prestigious Shanti Swarup Bhagnart Award in India in Earth Sciences and served as a lead author on the assessment report Working Group 1 of the IPCC. He's a professor at the Academy of Scientific and Innovative Research where he served as Dean of the Mathematical and Information Science. Um, he also has established climate modeling and monitoring network that has 26 multi-level meteorological profiles in various parts of the country involving 15 organizations. So we have another big picture leader here that is willing to share with us the experience in India. Yeah, let me first uh, start by thanking the organizers for providing me this opportunity to be with you here, a fantastic experience. I'd also like to share with you a small, you can say, anecdote. When I landed at uh, Denver Airport, I decided to take a bus to come to Boulder because it uh, gives me a glimpse of uh, the, you know, the country or the countryside. And I was very, very impressed by the friendliness of the people, the way they helped me. I was helped by a bus driver. I was helped by a commuter. I was helped by a shopkeeper to locate the hotel and uh, four or five people. So it, it was a very good experience. It has been a very good experience. And, uh, and although you, some of you might say that uh, my sample size has been very small, only four people, uh, I would say that the <coughs> conclusion has been very robust because there are multiple lines of evidence because there are different people involved. And uh, while I share with you my very high impression about uh, Boulder, I would also like to bring this point about significance versus robustness uh, when you discuss uh, some of these uh, issues about validation uh, later. So as you said, I come from this, uh, I, I had some problem, Alberto helped me out with these uh, technological glitches regarding this adopter, but uh, some things I could not put, for example, this is CSIR India, but that's a small problem. Uh, as, uh, so ours is not a very big group, uh, it's about uh, seven permanent scientists, and then we have PhD students, postdocs, and so on. What we do, our philosophy is to adopt what we call the hierarchical multi-scale modeling platform. So we have global model, which addresses issues like monsoon forecasting and climate simulation, that is at large scale, long time scales. But then we have also have mesoscale models, like for example, WRF, and uh, which we do for extreme events, cyclone simulation uh, with appropriate configuration. And then uh, we uh, link them with process models, for example, energy model. Uh, let me stop for a moment and uh, uh, elaborate a little bit what I mean by energy model. Of course, this whole conference has been in a way for energy forecasting, energy modeling, and so on. And the role that meteorology plays in uh, energy. But then you have other aspects of energy especially for a country like India, where the economy is changing or growing, uh, what happens is that the demands, energy demands, as well as energy supplies, they change with time. So you need to have a link model as an interface model that will probably take meteorological variables as primary drivers, but would also bring in a process model that tells you how uh, the you know, demand supply situation is changing. And probably the more meaningful parameter like uh, energy demand per household, because the number of households uh, is increasing and or per capita energy demand and so on. So that goes into the uh, process model category. Uh, similarly, we have, for example, like crop disease model. Uh, in fact, uh, our emphasis until recently had been on what is called vector-borne disease, like malaria and like dengue and so on. And the principle is the same. 
you have a vector population that demands, uh, depends very strongly on meteorological variables. And uh, once you have a larger vector population, you have larger host uh, vector encounters, and you have more disease incidences, and therefore it uh, grows up. In fact, uh, several of my papers, I don't know how many of you know about PLOS One as a journal, which is a more biology oriented journal. But now we have decided to take up energy models very, very seriously. We have started working on it. And maybe 2017, we will have some more papers aside from on that. We also link them to sustainability studies and, uh, of course, basic understanding. But sustainability studies basically goes beyond either only energy or agriculture or disease. They need to, they tend to combine them together. And what happens, for example, in many cases, we have already seen the extreme events. But you also have climate extremes, like drought. Now, if you have a prolonged drought, the energy scenario changes completely. Once the energy scenario changes completely, you have forced migration. Now, today we live in a world where boundaries are very strongly protected. You cannot say, oh, this area has become bad. Let us move on to another place. Uh, that is no longer uh, an uh, easy option. So uh, you need to bring in all together, and then you have to see what is the adaptation cost in such an extreme scenario as against, I think, in a country like Canada, which is very big and also sparsely populated, probably uh, you know, migration could be still a less uh, difficult uh, problem. So we do that. So therefore, we have these models. These are not models developed ab initio at our institute. These are adopted in the uh, global model. For example, we had uh, adopted a, a model from Laboratory for Meteorology, Dynamic Meteorology France. Uh, uh, one strong component in mesoscale model is WRF. In fact, I want to mention here that uh, you know, these two things, uh, the WRF community model and the answer pre-analysis, I think it changed the way meteorological research is being done worldwide. I mean, how, and I, I would like to come back to this when I talk about uh, OMC, because a single product can make a difference in, to, in, in, a, in the whole scenario. And then, of course, we bring in these algorithms and then diagnostics. So uh, in all of this, our emphasis is on actionable knowledge. Uh, against, you know, various, uh, uh, you can say, desirable things. So uh, I, I would like to uh, start something by saying about the scope of meteorology in energy, which is more of a synthesis of what I have learned in the last uh, few days and a couple of my talks. Uh, one thing is that, uh, uh, especially when we are talking about uh, the Indian perspective, I think that we can make the ICM scope a little broader. Uh, I say within bracket, it is uh, self-criticism, because it is my, mis uh, you can say, I was a member of the uh, scientific organizing committee. I could have pointed it out. Uh, but then, to tell you the truth, it occurred to me only when I listened to all of you the last couple of days, so it was already too late. But the point is that somebody, I think, uh -huh, I remember I mentioned how the government of India <laughs> had on one hand announced plans for uh, solar uh, or renewable in general, but on the other hand also approved plans for uh, coal. And why is it so? That's because in a diverse economy like in that in India, you cannot have a switch over uh, over a short period of time to, for example, from conventional to renewable. You need to uh, be s responsive, sensitive to needs of you know, different strata of in the society. And, uh, so my feeling is that if in, in, the, in, a, in a future meeting, we also have a session on meteorology and conventional energy, I think it will have much, much greater acceptability in countries like India. That's because they will be also be very happy to tell uh, the client type that, look, uh, it is not only about uh, Ethiopian 100% really renewable, which is what they may actually like, but it's also about what is affecting you tomorrow and today. Uh, then, of course, uh, meteorology and energy use uh, in terms of load forecasting that I have again said that you need to have a community. There is a community here uh, which is uh, sort of not really meteorologists and probably not uh, exactly energy operators either. They look at it more as a data-driven process and go into it in a data analytic, uh, you know, data mining mode. Uh, but then we need to bring in the load forecasting in a much more 
uh, in, you know, scientific way by having interface model, as I said. That I understand that uh, from the plenary talks in the first day as well as later, that it is uh, definitely a very big issue in operational management. This is now being appreciated in India, uh, but once again, I think the convincing arguments, proof of concepts are lacking. And I think that uh, maybe it is a peculiarity of this particular socioeconomic <coughs> system that uh, the extreme caution is exercised when the particular adaptation uh, you know, solution is uh, put into practice. One of the topics that were uh, meteorology and conventional energy, rather not, not only renewable, uh, can be important is, for example, in application of energy or associated hazards, associated, like for example, fallout. How the meteorology is going to affect the fallout of something like a nuclear leakout or you know, uh, some sort of industry too, uh, and but also, uh, as more importantly, nuclear uh, energy system. Um, so then this question of meteorology and best energy practices, uh, this is where I think UMC can play a big role. Uh, let me see if I can discuss that a little bit more later. And um, these are projections we have been discussing. Yesterday also we have discussed. And today, once again, you brought out this important point, uh, inherent dangers in adaptation. You have adaptation costs, but you have also have adaptation expenditure and risk of adaptation or over-adaptation. And uh, therefore, uh, those issues need to be discussed uh, carefully. And uh, then, already there have been a couple of talks that uh, when we scale it up, when we scale it up so as to go, go nearer to the 100% renewable, obviously the size of these solar farms, size of these wind farms, they are going to increase. And as they increase, will they become substantial, sustained perturbation to the local uh, circulation system. Uh, it's only beginning to be addressed. Well, I want to remind you of this book that was published by the World Meteorological Organization. Uh, this is an example where uh, energy or meteorological considerations are very, very important in energy practices. It's very old, I think, if I remember, it was 1976, or so very, very pioneering in thinking at that time that uh, these issues need to be considered. Uh, and there are lots of issues that need uh, specific modeling. Uh, so coming to this, therefore, the best practices, these are, uh, I see, as a major challenges. In, uh, the biggest question is the data optimality. And they need multi-source data, but at the same time, homogenize, make compatible with one another. And I do not have, I did not get an answer uh, even during this Nasib conference, what is the optimal data set we need for to address meteorological applications in energy sector? What are the variables? What are their temporal frequency needed? What are their horizontal resolution needed? What is the length of data needed? And so on. And there are many issues of data optimality. That, that question, I believe, remains unanswered. And I think that's a key step to go forward. Then, of course, we are now talking about energy from, from micrometeorology. You have big so solar installations, one coming up at uh, Jodhpur in India. That is 200-acre solar farm. Uh, and then you can understand that it has become a kind of an ecology by itself. You have all the solar panels. And that area is prone to what are called dust storms. Uh, one dust storm can do severe damage to your solar panels if left unexposed. So, you, uh, it is a, it's a kind of a different uh, topic. There have been talks about uh, you know, the large edge simulation, LES simulation, and uh, wake simulation, and so on. Uh, but you cannot do a single scale analysis and have a meaningful uh, output. I, I'm sorry to say, you need to have a multi scale. What happens due to the wake? What happens due to the local thunderstorm? And what happens due to the larger scale environment like such uh, This. Then I would like to touch upon what I call the optimum focus configuration. Uh, in many cases, um, the model that you get off the shelf is almost like a dough, uh, but you need to shape it to your uh, requirement, to your imagination, or to your uh, creativity. And I will try to tell you how much role it plays in this. And multi-scale modeling I have already touched upon. This word is used in two different ways. 
In one, the multi-scale modeling means that you have several physical scales, like in atmosphere and ocean, you have from uh, you know, eddies going right up to the planetary waves. But the, uh, the other uses that have come together is that you put together a different modeling paradigms to come up with a result. So you may have one part where this neural network is being applied, the regression model is being applied, then maybe even your uh, you know, various things like even cellular automata is being applied because that area where your uh, or dynamical equations do not apply, and then you go to the final product, uh, which is your error forecast or assessment. Uh, so this, uh, of course, uh, the reliability of projections remain a very big issue. Uh, the already, you have see, I think the previous talk had already shown what we have also discussed yesterday, the added complexity or to the models over the last half, for the, during the period from CMIP3 to CMIP5 had diminishing returns. It didn't really make much difference. And so then what is the way forward? And then I will come to the validation strategy, I think which is very, very important. And something that disturbed me during this uh, thing, and there was this repeated reference that when you do over uh, averaging over a larger scale, uh, your RMSC decreases. Well, of course, it will. But then so has your variability decreased when you average over a larger scale. So that re relevant parameter is a signal to noise ratio. That is, what is the error compared to the natural variability or noise? The error divided by sigma. That might have even increased. And that is because that quantity is relevant because error in a larger scale is more expensive than error at a smaller scale in general. So therefore, uh, we need to relook re at some of this. Now, this is a depressing slide. It shows an analysis of 43 CMIP-5 models and 23 CMIP-3 models, uh, which uh, we carried out uh, with respect to the, uh, their you know, reliability with respect to the Indian monsoon. Uh, do they, pro it's a hierarchical uh, elimination system. Do they produce the annual mean monsoon? Do they produce the internal variability? Then do they produce the historical trend? One model survived. Very, and not very well. One model survived. What is more depressing we find is, uh, you know, the square at the center. Uh, that square tells you that if you take six different observation data sets, they themselves have a fairly significant spread. The truth, the truth is no longer unique. The truth has a has a spread. So when we talk about therefore validation of our uh, energy uh, forecast and all that, we need to keep that in mind. That the, and, and then uh, there are also statements that um, uh, the simulations may be better than observation, which is actually <laughs> it's a very strange statement. Then what are you comparing against, <laughs> okay? So, uh, so we need to be careful about our philosophy, mm, yeah, but uh, this is something that is, I think, serious. Now, I talked about model configuration, and what I mean by is that in any numerical prediction model, be it a climate model, be it a mesoscale model, you have a hard core at the center. Those are continuum equations, you know, the numerical schemes, soft to an extent, climatological constraints. You can't do much about it. But that is only a small core. Surrounding that, you have a lot of soft uh, cores, like parameterization scheme, the grid structure, the free parameters, and so on. And you can mold them so as that you can get best performance over a region. And I give you a couple of examples. This is, we did it with a global circulation model, uh, the seasonal cycle of monsoon over India. And what happens is that when you do not do an optimization, and you just take the model and simply run it from whoever so you know, uh, kind-heartedly given it to you, and you get a, the bottom line has no, you know, Correlation is okay, but it doesn't have, in terms of magnitude and all that much correspondence with the observed cycle. But you do a careful configuration and optimization, and you get a much better. Uh, so here and there, wherever relevant, I put some of the uh, references, our published papers. Uh, but of, you can also contact me for details. Let me, um, yeah, this is uh, another issue about the downscaling or debiasing. Uh, in many of these things, we have seen that there is a bias. The point is that if it is a systematic bias, then of course you are lucky because you can always debias it in, a, in an objective way and get rid of the bias and you are in very good. But even if you did not have systematic bias, you can develop uh, skillful debiasing and uh, you know 
downscaling algorithms, which will give you much, much better. Uh, so, but you can see that these yellow ones, uh, you, can, you can see that uh, the uh, debiased, unbiased uh, forecast, and somewhere the uh, brown ones are the observed points, and other ones are the debiased forecast, and you begin to get pretty good station scale forecast uh, from those, uh, from the process. And this is these two papers in monthly weather review. Uh, before that, I jumped, so I talked about, uh, yeah. We also do this uh, uh, multi-hazard modeling. The reason being that quite often we do for one type of event, uh, let's say extreme events or something. But uh, please remember that a country like India, uh, for especially certain areas, are prone to different type of hazards. So if you are talking about a sighting uh, you know, uh, experiment, uh, then you need to consider uh, the at least over a 20 year period, which is typical life uh, you know, span of a moving farm, for, probably also for um, uh, solar. You need to do a multi-hazard analysis, landslide, earthquake, extreme rainfall events, and so on, so that you, have, you are actually better prepared. Uh, then, um, okay, now let me come to this um, little bit more specific, if we talk about 100% renewable for India. Uh, as you know that India has, uh, uh, essentially a little bit of each of these renewable, which I will come to that. But I have already emphasized that you have to have a gradual shift. Uh, you cannot have an abrupt, uh, you know, disruptive shift. It will not work. Uh, it will not work because there are, there will be opposition and opposition party will tell the ruling party how anti-poor they are doing being by taking that strategy and uh, then uh, ruling party will lose and then a new party also cannot adopt that because they have won the, on the platform that that policy is anti-poor, so it's those. Uh, but uh, some of the things are coming in a way that I'd like to propose at the end, that there's a very strong emphasis on smart villages and smart grids. And of course you cannot, I mean smart uh, villages and smart <coughs> cities. And you cannot have smart cities and smart villages unless you have smart grids and you know, smart energy sector. So they are probably meteorology could provide a tipping factor. It is, everybody knows that it is a, it's a multiple technologies, uh, you know, other socioeconomic issues involved, uh, but meteorology could play a tipping point. So as I said, India has, uh, uh, you have essentially all these six uh, at different scales. Uh, now there is a, the wind is primarily looked after by uh, Wind Energy Technology Institute at Chennai, South India. We now have a Solar Energy Research Institute, and there are, as I said, big initiatives, like 200 acre solar farms. But the others also, hydro has been there for a long time, and it has a big operational inertia to change in terms of uh, you know, operational procedure. And there have been some uh, you know, assessments and so on, uh, but uh, you will immediately point out that the assessment procedures might have been very, very archaic and very, very old and so on, and I will agree with you, so we can see what we can do about it. But uh, one thing is that uh, I have already mentioned that, uh, Shu has also mentioned, that we did put up some kind of observation network uh, over the country, and these are at uh, three, three levels, two meter, uh, 10 meter, 20 meter, and 30 meter. Uh, we could not go up to 100 meter and so on, but already you begin to see that, you know, uh, the advantage, for example, putting the turbine at, at particular heights and the differences that you may have from site to site. These are two examples uh, from uh, one at Almora, which is almost at the, the Himalayan region. The other one is at Delhi. Uh, it also shows that if you try to do, no matter how good uh, the ANSAP reanalysis is, but if you take that large you know, uh, coarse resolution data, now it is almost a 0.5 degree, I think, certainly one degree is easily available. You, this is one degree. You don't get uh, the uh, true picture, so you need local observations. And then you can get uh, gain a lot by, for example, uh, looking at the wind direction, uh, climatology of it, uh, because uh, it immediately tells you what it, you see at the bottom is that over this uh, location called Rajokri, your winds are primarily on the northwest uh, direction. So then uh, you know where a fallout or industrial leak will go 
uh, in case there is one uh, you know, uh, around the region. So that can certainly help you to plan evacuation as well as you know, even the siting of the industry and so on. Uh, so this is the same thing. And you release some uh, source uh, yourself or by does it, somebody does it, uh, whatever. And then you can ask various questions of the, you know, the, depending on the time of the day, release height, and you know, so on and so forth. Uh, where it is uh, likely to go, and uh, uh, so I think I have jumped here a little bit, but uh, I want to take it up here. As I said, uh, because of some technological glitches, I could not give the finishing touch to my PPT, so it just comes suddenly here. But uh, let me take it up because it looks like a big concern, or maybe the biggest concern in talking about this uh, uh, renewable energy and uh, so on is the cost. Uh, but I think, and I think I say this from primarily from Indian perspective, but I have a feeling that it will be universal. That if there is a quality to, you know, added quality to life for the environment, even a higher cost may be acceptable. So I think if an argument is given, it is not um, so much necessarily in terms of the cost, uh, you know, no comparison against conventional electricity and so on, but also the quality that it will bring to life quality that it will bring to the humanity as a whole, to the environment as a whole. And I think that in India, a higher cost in that consideration will be definitely accepted. Because, uh, because so what I'm saying is that there is a value system involved, but I'm also pretty confident, confident that it's a universal value system. If you bring in quality to the environment, quality to the you know, people and the flora and fauna and everything, and I think higher cost is fine. But we need to show that uh, we have costed it carefully, we have talked about environmental costs. We have included carbon credits. We have included uh, cost of uh, you know, conventional energy continuation and so on. And of course, the projections, which whatever they are inherent concerning. And uh, we can, in projection, I basically want to say that certain preparedness has to be built in. We have tried. This is an example of our, uh, basically, it's a segment of five-year simulation, but we have done up to 20 years and to show whether a global circulation model at least can capture the basic characteristics of the internal variability so that we can talk about, uh, you know, with some confidence, changes in the wind regime over the Indian region. We can see that it's not so bad. It is, of course, area average, so it is, uh, you know, uh, that problem about RMSC over <laughs> large areas will be here, but still it's some um, encouraging news. Then I want to tell about that at the same time, when you go for the all India average, for example, go to the mass scale variation within a uh, city. Suppose you want to do energy management within a city, which area is likely to need energy more and which area less? You first of all, the null hypothesis is that all of Delhi will be the same. So you need to convince them that no, it's not going to be the same. It is not the same. And this is an example. We have four stations in Delhi which are about 10 kilometers apart, maybe less than 10 straight as, the, as a crow flies. And uh, what you do see, I don't know if it's clear from these pictures a bit uh, jumble, but you can see there are some of these big spikes and differences. What it basically means, even in a few kilometers apart, the locations have big differences in temperature or wind. So uh, we did carry out how many days are, you know, uh, certain threshold, for example, ACs are switched on around 24 degrees centigrade in Delhi. Other places, it may be even lower than that. Uh, and then you find out that uh, these, uh, both in terms of time and uh, you know, duration, it can vary significantly uh, across these stations. Yeah, this is a, another example from South India. I don't think you can read those names. I think it will take you a while to get used to them. But uh, believe me, that these are in Tamil Nadu, South India, and they are sort of nearby stations. And they do show significant uh, variations in terms of wind energy potential, in terms of number of days which wind at a particular or above, above threshold. Which means basically that our observation system, I bring it uh, again to that question of data optimality. I think we are very, very suboptimal in uh, our data to address energy or meteorology in energy. Uh, then, uh, this is a happier thing. Uh, we did, in 2010, this is another state in South India, is Karnataka. Uh, it's a state in Karnataka, uh, South India, Karnataka, 
and they had problems with uh, this agriculture. They wanted to help the farmers, and the question was that can you give them you know, forecasts so that they can decide whether they should spend money on irrigation or anyway rain is coming. So we did that. It's a five-fifth year now, and very good uh, uh, experience. And uh, uh, these are some of the letters from the government and uh, directors of the institute and so on. But uh, we did also a calculation that every time you help the farmer to avoid, because the numbers are large, you have something like 70 lakh, 70 million, or what, 7 million. You have uh, farmers, marginal farmers. And even if they avoid one uh, avoidable irrigation, they save a lot. Uh, but uh, this, uh, we do this approach that we do outreach. But at the same time, we make sure that the results are peer reviewed in uh, SCI journals. So basically what I'm saying is that uh, in this case, if we're writing not only for India, India, we, we will have to bring more people, which has been already emphasized. One community that is missing here is the architects. And if you are going to integrate renewable energy to households, I think they are going to play a very important role. And I'm not talking in the spirit of uh, thanks for all that fish, where you say space fly, flight, what color it should be, <laughs> the, the deciding factor. But really, really, that aesthetics and you know functionality must be considered and brought in. So, so I want to say that in some of the cases, uh, how maybe WMC can help, and. Um, and then I would like to, one issue was capacity building. So this is my visualization that maybe we had this book by uh, or WMO, maybe we can, 2016 we can have meteorology and energy and maybe 2017 we can have 100% renewable energy vision. And, um, and then I would like to say something very you know, provocative. I say that let's have a technology demonstrator a renewable energy village, which initially may have more cost, it doesn't matter, but all issues that crop up and can be envisaged can be solved, and then it becomes a proof of point, then debug as the people begin to you know, use it, then upgrade, and then finally scale up and replicate. It can be done anywhere in the world and then replicated all over the world. And then, of course, we will also talk about, uh, somebody mentioned that we need to talk about in a more comprehensive way, what if there is a mega drought, uh, water is uh, you know, withdrawn, and then your energy expenditures go up because you need to uh, withdraw water from a deeper level and so on. So this is what I would like to propose that um, our, as our approach, and uh, thank you. Well, thank you for the very interesting talk. And um, you know, not only did you write a great call for papers for ISM 2017, but uh, you know, a nice picture of research needs as well as how we need to come together. We'll take a couple minutes for a question or two. On the western part of India, along the coastline, the it's uh, the meteorology is partly dominated by the monsoon. The wind energy potential during the monsoon is very, very good. The wind energy potential outside the monsoon period is very, very low. This strong seasonality in the wind potential, could you comment on this and what problems it poses? Yeah, that's a very important question. I mean, uh, it's not only in the Western Ghats. I think that's what you're referring to, uh, the Western Ghats in the uh, southern India. Yeah. But uh, in many places, uh, India has a very strong seasonality in terms of the uh, monsoon, which is uh, typically from June to September. Uh, uh, so there are two issues. One is, of course, uh, fortunately for Western Ghats, they are also affected by northeast monsoon, which is not often highlighted. But the southern part also gets northeast monsoon, which is basically October to almost December, certainly no November. The seasonality in southern India a little bit less. In northern India, the monsoon is curtailed, and it is also less uh, uh, strong compared to the southern India. So yes, uh, there are two ways. One, of course, is the obvious way that you integrate, like solar, uh, because which becomes uh, you know less uh, interrupted during the non-monsoon period because monsoon is characterized by clouds. You have winds, but less solar. But in the other period, you have solar. So you and also post-monsoon, the hydropower picks up. 
there is a huge uh, hydropower projects here, which is already uh, working on that. They are, I mean, helping it out. So I think it is a technology integration, and this is what I have also mentioned that when you talk about a site, let us not talk about only in isolation like wind and solar and hydro. Uh, in this area, for example, there's a very good opportunity for integrating solar as well. Hydro is already there, and should be applicable to many other areas like that. Of course, you don't get hydro over other time, but then you get abundant solar to make up for that. Okay, so um, to what extent is your government, um, you know, being supportive of developing the, uh, uh, you know, these energy sources uh, that will make renewables and and et cetera possible and decrease climate et cetera, climate change, et cetera? Yes, I mean, I'm not a government spokesperson, but let me tell you my perspective as I see as a citizen or as a scientist citizen. Uh, I think government is very committed to renewable energy and uh, its penetration, its generation, and also the consequence on climate change and you know, reduced emission. I'll give, you a, I'll give you a simple example. There is a city, a very small city, just about 200 kilometers from Bangalore, which is a big city, uh, relatively. And they have established this, Suzlan has basically established this wind farm. And that changed the, the whole ecology. It's a, it is an arid region, not very productive agriculturally. But because of this energy farm, a city is now coming up around that. And very big organizations like Indian Space Research Organization and Indian Institute of Science, uh, Defense Research Organization, they are taking up thousands of acres and all that. And now it is made sure that there is a sort of sense of leapfrogging that the past mistakes that have been made elsewhere in doing this kind of development are not repeated. So that these establishments, they may be a little bigger, but they should be completely eco-friendly. So what I, I say there is that the importance of this proof of concept, because Suzlan has done it, government has gained confidence, and that is a barren land. These are all hilltops. It's a sight to behold, because uh, so uh, I, I think there is a very strong commitment. and. Uh, this 200 acre wind, uh, solar farm is another example, uh, but uh, they are going cautiously. Of course, in hydro, you have a challenge because anything you try to do in the you know the upper Himalayan region and so on becomes an international issue, right? <laughs> so, so there you have some challenges, but otherwise for solar and wind, yeah. Let's thank Dr. Goswami again.